Hi, everyone. This is Rebecca Lee. Really delighted to have you all here today um, to listen to top five questions you should consider before embarking on a data sharing program. We'll begin shortly. Uh, I just wanted to mention a few logistical things. So today's program is live and will be recorded for future distribution. We will be sending a link to the recording and the slides shortly. So a few things just to note for our WebExes is to post your questions via the chat. You will be muted throughout this WebEx. So if you have any technical difficulties or any questions as we go through, please do post your questions in the panel to the right of your screen. We will be answering questions um, as we go through. If we don't get to all of the questions, we will get back to you after the WebEx and we will be sending the link to you afterwards for you to review and for you to send on to your colleagues. Uh, so those are some of the things that we will, be, um, we will be doing after the presentation. So I see that a few more people are logging on. I'll just wait one more minute before we get started today. Okay, terrific. So again, you will be muted throughout this program, and then if you have questions, please do put them in the uh, pane to your right. So this is our agenda today. We at FISLY often rec receive inquiries along the lines of when should we implement our data sharing program? And you might be someone just beginning your data sharing journey or doing this, been doing this for some time but starting to outgrow a homegrown sharing system. You might have processes that function well initially and now the rate of incoming inquiries may be just a bit more than those systems can handle or perhaps you're considering a change from what you've been currently doing. Now, some companies or institutions might be beginning the data sharing program and might be clinically early stage or already have a marketed drug, or maybe you're in an academic institution. I started my career, my name is Rebecca Lee, I'm the executive director of Vivli, and I started my career at a small biotech company I understand the intensity of the startup experience as well as the experience of a more mature mid-sized company and as well as being at a pharma company. Data sharing can often be an afterthought to the challenges of bringing treatments to the clinic. And today we'll focus our time today in five major areas. First of all, we'll talk about why should we share. I know I'm probably preaching to the converted because you're here today. Um, just spend some time on that. And what are the key components of a data sharing program and some of the policies you should be considering? When should we actually start to thinking, be thinking about this?
Can you hear me? Uh, yes, hello, we can hear you. I, I can't. Okay, just bear can you with hear me, me now. Okay, I can hear you. sorry yes. about that. I had a temporary, um, I think my mic disconnected. So let me, let me just start over um, and use my computer. This might be a little awkward, but hopefully we can move from this. Um, so why should my institution or company share its data? So if you're in industry, a number of trade organizations um, have publicly stated commitments for their members for sharing data and at the IPD level or participant level data. And certainly there are journal requirements that come into play this year. And most importantly, our ethical obligations are to those that take place in clinical trials. And there are you know, myriad other reasons that we want to highlight, of course, um, you know, but most importantly, those ethical obligations to our trial participants. In terms of trial registration, data sharing is really part of the clinicaltrials.gov registration record. And in terms of the IPD data sharing statement, our plan, you know, there are three, three major um, choices. First of all, you can choose yes. There are, uh, the, the, you know, the three choices are either yes, there is a plan to make IPD available. No, there's not a plan to make IPD available or undecided. Now, interestingly, um, even though I, undecided is one of the choices, as of um, in terms of ICMJE, that is not one of the choices that ICMJE actually allows. So that is, there's really a disconnect between what clinical trials allow, .gov allows, and what um, ICMJE allows. So that is one of the things to really just to note there. In terms of what journals have started requiring as of July 1st, you know, ICMJEs, what major journals are included is um, New England Journal of Medicine, JAMA, The Lancet, BMJ, Annals. Trial manuscripts really must be submitted with a data sharing statement, and that includes how you'll share your IPD, who, what, when, where, and why. IPD sharing is not yet required, but editors are really taking this into consideration, these data sharing statements when making editorial decisions. So those of you that will be submitting a journal publication, this is exceedingly important so that, you know, we've covered really what are the obligations for these trade organizations as well as, um, you know, what journals are requiring as well. And then lastly, you know, and, and very importantly, what are patients really expecting? More, more and more patients are expecting that data sharing is coming out of, you know, they're very personal contributions. Um, so that's what we're hearing. And these are some of the tweets from a summit from data sharing hosted from the New England Journal in 2017. So next let's go through, I mean, we, I know I'm preaching to the converted, but what are the key components of a data sharing, a data sharing program? Three of the major elements that we ask our members to consider is first of all, policy, um, what are the data sharing policies that undergird a successful data sharing program, the mechanism, how you'll actually share, and thirdly, what resources need to come to bear for a successful data sharing program. So let's step through these one by one. So what we found in our experience is in the area of data sharing, transparent external data sharing really tends to equal good public policy. And we'll see what that actually looks like in practice. Data sharing policies very much vary based on a sponsor or institution's current portfolio, experience with data sharing, and quite frankly, risk tolerance. So we'll, I'll show you some real examples of what that might look like, and we can have some discourse um, we often sit down with our members to talk about 
where you might be based on your current portfolio and what you might tolerate in terms of your data sharing policy. So, you know, it very much varies and is customized, but we'll give you some good examples on data sharing policy. And we'll just touch upon that briefly today. So in terms of key considerations when formulating policy, at the very high level, thinking about key questions. So I'm just boiling this to the top four questions to think about some of the major decisions you'll make as you formulate your policy. Um, which studies will you share? Are there exceptions to sharing these, um, these studies? On a specific questions uh, re request or proposal, who would be the primary decision maker and would you delegate that to another body? And what are the review criteria? So how are, how are um, decisions made? So let's step through these in a little bit more detail and think through some of the considerations that would underlie these as you think these through. Okay, so let's take the first one. What studies would you share, right? So this of course would be different for an academic institution, a foundation, or more of a startup. Okay, so a biotech company. So when we think about this policy, many times it might be overwhelming, right? So we might think about starting from a date forward. So oftentimes we talk with, with our partners about picking a date and going forward from there. Um, so that you might wanna think about a date in which you would be comfortable sharing forward and then thinking about certain phases, right? And we know uh, for those of you who might be members of Pharma FPA, they have certain policies, but you might wanna pick a date forward from where you might be comfortable sharing. And then whether you'd be comfortable sharing both submitted and approved products or narrowing that scope somewhat further. So those are the three major areas that you might wanna consider a starting point for sharing. So let me give you just a little bit of an example to make this more concrete. So here are some real um, more examples. For example, uh, example one is we will share interventional clinical trials conducted in patients phases one through four for products and indications submitted and approved since 2002 uh, will be shared. So that's more of a broad sharing um, in example one from that institution. Example two is that company sponsors study supporting indications approved in both the US and Europe after J January 1st, 2013 will be considered for sharing. So you can see that example two has really narrowed the aperture in terms of how they would share. So that's uh, just two examples that I'm showing in terms of that they've considered the date, phases, and the submitted and approved products. So once you've kind of thought those three questions through, we can think about exceptions to sharing. Right? So how are you going to refine that even more? And having conducted clinical trials, I know, you know, even if you have a date forward, there might be some practical constraints to what you might want to share. Um, and you know, when we talk about the documents that you might want to share, you might not, you might want to restrict those to those that are electronically available. Certainly you might not want to go back to paper, um, some legal or contractual constraints. You might have um, share products that are shared with other partners that might not be currently sharing to the extent that you are constraints on language. Um, so perhaps you want to you know, restrict this to those that are available in English, for example, and then anonymization standards. So those are exceptions to sharing that we, um, that you might want to consider putting bounds or language around that makes this uh, just a little bit easier for your teams as you're moving forward to uh, data sharing. 
So let's talk about some uh, examples of how that might play out in your data sharing policy. So for example, studies where there is a reasonable likelihood that a patient's anonymity can, cannot be maintained, for example, in very rare diseases, studies with a very low patient numbers, or studies performed at a single center. Um, so those are ultra rare diseases. We still have studies on Vivli where there are rare diseases, but really certainly studies that with extremely low patient numbers. Um, also, there are practical constraints to providing the data, for example, issues related to um, the data being still in paper, CRFs or databases, or resources constraints where there is considerable burden to retrieving the data, or the study documentation is not in English. So those might be constraints as well. Thirdly, an area where you might want to consider is on a specific request, who makes the final decision on whether to share. So that is also something that should be transparent in your data sharing policy. Um, this is normally a body and we'll talk about who that could be. You might want to delegate that externally because oftentimes um, externally that, that has a different uh, perspective on, on how the public views that. And, and what are, are the review criteria? How are decisions made? So let's talk about how, how you might want to think about that. So who could make the final decision on whether to share? And so at Vivli, we're actually agnostic to who makes the final decision, but we actually require our members to make this public on who makes these decisions and how the decisions are made. So we'll, let me just give you some examples on how that could be uh, made public in your policy and some um, and how that is done on Vivli. And certainly if you make your own policy, that could be looking somewhat different. So as we've seen it done for data sharing, there are really three major decision makers. For example, you might have an internally internal approving entity. So a team that sits separate from your clinical team that would approve this these requests or approvals that could sit internal to your institution. Um, much like maybe an IRB, so they would maintain um, the approving power. Um, an external review panel, so someone that you would pay to sit external to your entity, institution, or company, or an independent review panel or an IRP. We have one, um, the secretariat is uh, the Welcome Trust. So that is completely independent from you and is um, another possibility. So those are really the three entities that could make uh, to the decision. So an example of how that might work, at least at Vivli, is step one. Our administrator kind of facilitates the request moving forward, ensures the required fields are completed. We don't actually make any decisions. The data contributor or sponsor would really do some kind of feasibility check and do any additional review criteria that might vary by the sponsor, could be applied at that step. And then the third step is really an approving entity scientific review panel or IRP would make some review depending on the criteria. So those are how this could work, and this is how it works, at least for our, um, for Bibli. So when we look at this in a little bit more of a granular level, for example, if we just focus on option one, some data contributors, when you look at the kind of, the data contributor does their feasibility check, can we actually fulfill the request? And they might layer on some additional review criteria. Some of them send it to an external review panel only when it is not approved. So they would simply adjudicate those non-approved requests or proposals. Option two is really 
um, those that send it to an independent review panel that reviews this for scientific rationale, publication plan, COIs or conflicts of interest, and qualifications of the team. So that's another option that has kind of the, um, the stamp of an external or independent review panel that does review this for, um, for scientific rationale. Other key considerations for formulating policy is what are the re review criteria that are applied? These also need to be made uh, public and so showing others how are the decisions made? Um, are there, for example, team qualifications that are required? At Vivli, we believe that a statistician um, should be on the team. There should be a hypothesis in scientific rationale, conflicts of interest, and there might be other re review criteria that are important to the institution or company that might be reviewed at this step. So here are some examples, you know, that could be applied here. Um, and I'm just showing here, in determining whether a specific request shall be granted, the company will consider, and here are how they might be proposed here. Some of our members apply additional review criteria at this, at this point, and they post those on our member pages. Now, wrapping up the section on policy, it might seem to some that there is quite a bit on policy and it is complex, but to be quite honest, all of this policy fits on our members on their member page. It is externally facing and we provide templates for all of these and it is actually um, fits on a single page. So it is probably seems overwhelming what we covered, but it is simple and it fits on a single member page. This is Biogen's for an example. And, um, and, and um, when we answer these questions, these four questions that we just covered, it is, uh, it is, it is templated and it's not as, um, is not as complex as it might seem. So the other questions that we might want to consider when considering the mechanism, so let's step through, you know, we covered already, you know, the policy. So let's cover the mechanism, how you'll actually be sharing this externally. What is the mechanism by which you'll be sharing the data itself? So some considerations would be security, can the data be shared secured, securely? External interface, is it user-friendly? What is the team interface? So all our sponsors or members, you know, your team itself, what are the touch points for the data sharing team at your own institution? Communication, does the mechanism allow for interaction with the users? Support, is there support offered for users? And integration, can the data be integrated? and flexibility. As, as um, technology grows, is the system flexible enough and it, will it be able to be developed over time? Um, so those are some of the key things to consider. So next, let's talk about when should we begin a data sharing program? So oftentimes we are interacting with a member's early stage, sometimes late stage. And this is a common question that we're asked, is when should we actually start? So let's touch upon that too. Is a recommendation on when to share and what to actually share. And this is actually gleaned from recommendations based on the IOM report sharing of clinical trial data. So as we think about trials being registered in clinicaltrials.gov or UGRCT, data sharing plan at registration, we already covered that. Now the study is actually completed or terminated. Um, but let's just say it actually comes to completion. Um, and then there is a publication, a primary publication that comes out six months after publication. IOM recommends, and we do as well, to share the post-publication data package. Right? 
So this really is the data set that underlies the tables, the figures, the graphs in the paper. This is typically a subset of the entire data set, not the entire data set itself normally, right? So if you're public publishing on only the primary outcome, this would really only be the tables, figures, and graphs on the primary outcome that would be shared in terms of the IPD, okay? Then 18 months after the product abandonment or 30 days after regulatory approval is a recommendation to share the post-regulatory data package. So this is really um, the recommendation of the IOM and, and really good practice. So this is also where we have uh, made recommendations to our members in terms of timing. Um, obviously, this is not a regulatory um, recommendation, but when others ask us what is the timing to share, this is how we have come up with a recommendation as well. So after everything we've talked about for timing and when to get started, we recommend to get started on a data sharing program and plan how you're going to share the mechanism, getting policy started at least 18 months before your major publication is slated and before regulatory submission. So if you're thinking about um, that you have a regulatory approval ready um, or your publication is coming out, you know, of course, sooner is better. Um, and if you already have a, a product approved, but at least 18 months ahead of time is when uh, things could get started and to start your data sharing program. So that's really enough time to start thinking about your policies, how you're going to be sharing and getting things in place. So if you're part of Pharma FPA or you're, you're a, um, or you're an academic institution, this is, gives you enough time to actually get your internal processes um, up to speed or to think about working with someone externally. So in terms of timing for getting the data ready, this is also something that we've been asked about. Once you've selected the studies, and let's think about this, if you've gotten your policies in place, you've thought about, you know, I want to share everything after 2015, you've decided on the phases, you've decided on your policy, the data itself does not need to be anonymized and all ready to go. In fact, the data contributor often anonymizes the data requested and uploads it um, on demand, as we say. So the research team requests the data, the data request review happens, the DUA is assigned, the data use agreement is signed, and then it is made available, the data request is uploaded and made available once that request is put in. So we tell our members that the data itself doesn't have to be anonymized and ready to go until a request has actually been made for that data. So that is one thing to keep in mind, is your data is not actually ready to, to be uploaded into a platform such as Vivli until there's a request for it. So let's talk about the what data part. So what data should be shared? We have a recommended data package set that includes the protocol, the data dictionary, which is the detailed descriptions of variables, the SAP, the clinical study report, that is for industry members, and then of course the raw data itself. Um, optional items could include the analytical code, the AR, the anal analysis ready IPD, and the CRFs, the case report forms. So this really comprises the complete data package, as we call it. So lastly, let's hit upon how can you manage a data sharing program? So, um, you know, many manage this successfully in-house to build, manage, and update a platform. Um, having a team ready internally, resources to manage the platform is also something to consider. 
to negotiate the legal agreements, manage the user queries, generate metrics, anonymize the data, the data preparation, the policy, drafting and managing data sharing policies. These all need to be done um, if you're to manage this in-house. Others lean on a trusted partner to manage and assist with the mechanism, the team, and the policy. So that's really where Vivli comes in. So partners like Vivli can really help with the mechanism, the policy, and to be an extension of your team. So those are really the three sections, you know, the policy, the mechanism, and the resources. The Vivli solution really comes into play where we provide expertise and policy development. We have harmonized agreements for users. In terms of a mechanism, we have the platform to securely share your data. And of course, our team really manages user queries as well. If you're interested in scheduling a demo, certainly we can discuss how Vivli can help you to embark on your data sharing program. So that really, I mean, we're delighted to have you join us today. And, and certainly this ends the formal part of our presentation. Um, if you have questions, I'm happy to answer them. Um, in the chat, I know Julie's been answering questions as we've gone through here today. So thank you so much for joining us, um, for joining us today. Thanks again. And as uh, Julie mentioned, um, this will be available on, um, and this will be taped and we will um, disseminate this uh, afterwards. If you would like to send this to any of your colleagues, uh, we will distribute this afterwards. So again, thanks so much for your uh, attendance and time here today. Thank you.